All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the the uh, kickoff of the Grease Select Dealer webinar. Um, looking forward to getting back to doing this after a very busy, hot summer. Um, glad that everyone could take the time to join us. Looks like we've got 111 participants and growing. So looking forward to uh, sharing some interesting information with y'all today. Uh, today we have, whoops, if I can get the slides to work. Um, James McIntyre, our National Commercial Technical Manager, and Greg Bunt, Brunts, our Technical Advisor. I'm Daniel Hamrick, Director of Technical Support, and we're going to be sharing with you today uh, Grief Flex Airflow Performance. Um, a few things we're going to go over is airflow settings, uh, measuring static pressure, verifying CFM, and system performance as a whole. So a couple of uh, housekeeping items uh, to keep in mind as we as we move forward. This is an interactive webinar. We'd love for you to ask questions, and we'll try to answer those questions as we go along. So we'll all be monitoring the Q&A box. But please, if you can, make sure to put the questions in the Q&A, not the chat, um, so that we can just focus on that one place to answer your questions. All right, airflow settings. Um, James, Greg? Yes, I don't have a problem getting into this. So, <laughs> so uh, just to kind of start it off, you know, when we uh, are talking about setting up our airflow, you know, we got to keep everything in mind. You know, what are the CFM requirements? A um, little bit of a side note on that. Um, you know, the industry standard's always been 400 CFM per ton. And then if you're in the climates where you don't have as high, high, as high humidity, you go on as far as 450 CFM per ton. And then a lot of guys I, I've seen over the years don't really um, use a lot, utilize it that much. But in your high humidity areas, a lot of times they would set them at 350 CFM per ton. So with the flex unit, I would tell you that 400 CFM per ton would be the max. We don't need to go over that. And 350 CFM per ton is probably more the sweet spot. Uh, I think we could even get down to 325 CFM per ton and you're still going to be okay. So when you're setting up your dip switches, you know, keep that in mind, you know, 325 to 300. 50 CFM per ton in most applications is going to be the sweet spot. Uh, but also keep in mind, you know, things about your register sizes. Do you have an adequate return? Are you using media filters? What is the static pressure to system? And make sure that the static pressure is not too high because if a motor, and it doesn't really matter what air handler it is, what furnace it is, if it's fighting high static, that's undue stress on the motor that doesn't need to happen. So with that, we and, can kind of- And ahead. the system overall, right, Greg? Absolutely, which we, we've got some slides in this um, where I've shown, you know, before and after, you know, uh, basically having the blower set too high, in my opinion, for the system to give us the best performance. And then after speed change, what it actually did to the system, so. Excellent. James, you got any move, move to the any, next one? No, you're input you're there. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, 350 CFM is, is good. I mean, I, uh, you know, the lower the airflow, the more I can dehumidify, right? Uh, so that's always a good thing to do. I mean, I know 400 CFM per ton is a, is a nice old rule to follow, but, you know, there's a lot of rules of thumbs that, uh, rules of thumb, excuse me, that, Probably need some adjustment, you know, uh, <laughs> especially since, uh, I mean, duct work now looks a lot different than duct work used to, right? I mean, I, I think we, we see that every time we go out in the field or every time we see, oh, there you go. Uh, every, every time we see, uh, you know, pictures on Pro Talk or something, you know, on, on Facebook or whatever, um, you know, the, the duct work that people are doing now is, is significantly different than the duct work they used to do. 
Uh, you don't see as many round pipe truck lines with short runoffs or you know, short takeoffs anymore. You see, you know, 40 foot runs of flex and Y's and duckboard triangle things and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So it's, I mean, you know, it's quite a I bit. can go, I go back. I used to love to go to my grandma's house, live down in the city of St. Louis. And let me tell you what, talk about difference in duck work. That in the era that that house was built, that was a true art. I mean, it was all square duck, but every change fitting was a, a rounded fitting made, you know, out of sheet metal. So there was no, you know, 90 degree turns in square sheet metal. It was a rounded radius turn. That duck worked in there. I wish I had pictures that I would have kept of all that, but the duck work in that house was just, you could tell it, it took them a long time to build it. It was not cost efficient today. It would be today's world, but my God, you couldn't ask for sweeter looking duck work. I mean, you could almost just take pictures of it. It was that worthy. So, but I mean, that's the way building was done back then. You know, you go in the mold buildings and towns with all the marble and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, at one time, you know, in my opinion, Duckwork was an artistic thing. Those guys took that serious. And then it was a craft. Fitting. It was definitely a craft. Yeah. And I remember my grandma had her bathroom redone and I had to go in there and redo the ductwork. And I did it the way I knew how to do it. And I felt embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, but it works, you know, but oh my God. I, I mean, I just didn't have the tools to make it the way they did it, you know? So if you did a change out with a flex, you'd put it on speed eight, right? No. no <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into uh, indoor dip switch configuration. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll take the punch on that. I agree. Them dip switches are really small. <laughs> They're really kind of tricky to get in there and set. But I mean, once we get them set and we get airflow verified, you shouldn't really, it should be a one time thing. But this is so. this is kind of a, a standard thing across the industry setting up the the fan right absolutely yeah. there's no factory setting I, I used to love that i always hear that when i've done technical service for oh god over 12 years now and i've heard that same saying over and over and over again well it was factory set no there's n nothing's factory set you have to make sure the dip switches are set for the installation that you're doing and then verify that we're, we're the system's performing the way it was intended for you to have it set up to perform at and the equipment was designed to perform at. I mean, it enables you to dial it in to meet the, uh, the needs of the, of the space you're trying to cool or heat. I mean, absolutely. The, I mean, it's variable. If you, I mean, the one product that doesn't have a variable nature to it is a, you know, ductless mini split. Well, better not have duct on it, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've seen that too but uh that's factory set but you know we're not throwing duct work on it right yeah but when you're taking a system where where you're actually adding things to the system like duct work and filters and register grills and 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 then now it becomes more of a field setup than it is like you're talking about with the, just a mini split where you know you're tying in uh, a factory made uh, indoor unit and a factory made outdoor unit and all you're doing is connecting two pieces together there's no additions to it yeah. and so this is the chart for the a series air handler yes uh, we have a slide in there for the b as well yes we okay. do so the uh, the a series you know if you're still running into those the heat and cool have to be set for the same if you want to know why it's labeled that way, well, at one time there was going to be an option to be able to set a heat for, you know, the heat for one CFM and static and cool for another CFM and static, but that idea was scrapped. Um, but realistically, a heat pump heat mode, cooling mode should be running at the same speed. Right. I mean, that's the way it's always been, even unitary product, it's always been your heat pump speed runs the same as your cooling speed. Right. Now, if you're talking strip heat, that's a different story. But 
with the flex, we should have minimal on time of strip heat because this is truly a low ambient heat pump. Right. Unless you're in Alaska. If you put them like I put them in, you don't have one anyway, right? <laughs> That's right. I didn't install one in mine either. Yeah. I'm not pulling a wire. <laughs> nope. <laughs> So and that's why basically on this webinar, we're, we're talking static pressure for uh, as far as one way of, of verifying airflow, as you'll see as we go through this. There is other ways, but a lot of these systems are being installed with no heat kits. So we just decided to stick with just using static pressure because and just go with the, in this instance, like we don't have strip heat. Right, right. All right, so as you can see, um, the there's different settings. This is just the A at the moment, which I think um, hopefully you're familiar with this already. But uh, as James was saying, the heat and the cool are set the same uh, across these. And then as we move forward into the BH, you'll notice that the speed, the dip switch settings are different between the heat and the cool. On the cool, they all stay the same, right, James? Yeah. Uh, across all of the models of the B revision uh, air handler. Right. So they're, they're, you're not messing with the cool settings, just right. the bank that says heat. And, and, the, and that is, you know, those are set like that from the factory. That's the reason why the heat will be different than the cool, you know. Um, you know, maybe the next iteration we'll have them just remove. Either we're going to have two settings for heat and cool, or we'll just have them remove their writing from it and just go right. SMC2 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, remove the heat and cool because that that's brought us a lot of questions in tech support. You know, is it a different fan speed? No, it's not. It's just one fan speed setting. Right. So keep in mind, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions too. I've had a phone call myself of why there's no Y terminal on the B air handler and what do they do with the Y terminal? So, you know, there is a lot of machinery out there that requires Y to segregate the speed from what you would get if you got a fan on called the G only, and then you got a Y call that would designate it as cooling or heat pump heating speed. On the flex air handler, Y is not required. Your blower speed is based off of G and it will run at whatever you set the dip switches for on the heat side. And that speed setting is what you're going to get from G. Now, most heat pump thermostats, when you're in heat pump heating mode, should be energizing that G terminal of that thermostat to bring the blower on in heat pump heating mode. So it doesn't need to designate it off of Y. There also seems to be a lot of confusion in the heat pump industry where they think that Y is cooling and W is heating mode. That's simply not true. Uh, any heat pump system out there, Y is going to be energized, whether it's in heating mode or cooling mode, doesn't matter. And then what designates whether or not it runs in heat mode or cooling mode is going to be a reversing valve. Now, industry standards always use OB terminal. O has always been designated as energizing and cooling mode. B has always been uh, designated as heating mode. And a lot of your modern right. thermostats, your OB terminal is the same terminal. And if that's the case, you need to go into the installer setup of that particular thermostat and make sure on the flex we are energizing in the heat mode. So another derivative, and I'm kind of getting off subject for just a second because we get a lot of phone calls about this. So once you put the selector switch to heat, if it's set up right, that reversing valve should be energized, regardless of whether or not the machine is calling for it to actually be running. And then if you go to the outdoor board, the board will display on because that reversing valve is energized. Something's on, machine's not running, but something's on, the reversing valve is on. Then when you get your call to Y, it'll actually run in heat pump heating mode. So I hope that takes away some confusion if any of you guys have ran into that and get a little better understanding of, of how the controls turn this machine on. 
I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Greg. The, the, the difference, like the, the terminology on the terminal board for the low voltage in the BH revision, uh, they took away the Y. So they had, they're using the same terminal block indoor and out. Um, it's the same part. And what they did is they took away the Y. So you just connect the Y together by itself in, in the air handler when you are running your low voltage. And then they needed that Y terminal for something else. Well, what they used it for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on this, but it is D and that stands for defrost. Um, so the outdoor unit has a D terminal as well. When it goes into defrost, it can send a signal to the indoor. So the indoor unit knows that the outdoor is in defrost mode. Now, if you do not have an electric heater kit installed, it will shut the fan off during that defrost mode. I've, I've tested this myself and seen it happen. Um, if you want more details, I'll test it again and write down step by step exactly what it does. Um, but it's so it knows. And, and if there's not a call on B at the air handler, it will not shut the, the fan down. So it knows the indoor air handler control board knows that it's in heat because you have a B terminal connected at the indoor. Um, and then it knows that it's getting a D signal from outside to tell it to, um, to shut the fan down. So Daniel, I'm actually glad you took that one step further because in, in with, with that, if you don't have a backup heat, then I'd highly recommend you make sure you hook up that D to D so mm -hmm. that we do shut down that fan and we're not blowing cold air or what the homeowner deems as cold right. air or feels as right. cold air. They may never notice smoke, but if they do, they you know, they may call and say, Hey, this thing's, you know, putting cold air out in the winter <laughs> for a short period anyway. All right. We've got a few questions here. If y'all want to go over these before we move on. Um, what about for a five ton dip switch? Uh, Felix is asking. Not sure what that means. Do you have the five ton dip switch chart in this presentation? We do. Yes, we do. Okay. We'll show it. All right. And then uh, Mick uh, is asking what is SA1 and SA2? That's just the two different uh, dip switch banks, basically. And then William is asking uh, eight speeds question mark. So on the B revision, there is eight speeds. On the A revision, there's only three speeds. And that's so eight that, speeds per capacity. So you've got for the three ton, you've got eight uh, different speeds. With with a blow, with blower curves for each one for the two ton you would have eight different blower curves four ton five ton same thing so technically speaking if you have one air handling you got sixteen speeds but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay my uh, Mike is asking I always find it oh he's just making a statement I always find it easier to think of why as compressor rather than cooling that's a good point because why why in my mind yellow or why always triggers compressor to me right i mean you know in my head it's contactor but hey whatever you know yeah it, it's always <laughs> compressor in my head <laughs> oh well, i can't guarantee that compressor is going to start you know? well that's true <laughs> uh, uh grant is saying uh does the heat pump start in heating immediately the reason I ask this is because I've learned that the Bosch inverter heat pump actually starts in cooling. Then once the pressure gradient is achieved, the reversing valve is energized for heat. Good question, James. Yes, it absolutely starts in heat immediately. Okay. Good to know. And Mike uh, says, uh, does fan come on in defrost mode in the A air handler? Yes, so, it does. Yes, the, the, fan, fan. the fan continues to run. There's, continues. No, there's no interface, I guess you'd say. There's no 24-volt signal coming from the outdoor unit that would tell it that it's in defrost mode. So right. 
uh, in that, you know, if you don't have a heat kit installed, uh, you could have cold air uh, there for about a minute or so. Uh, the longest defrost time that we've seen on the A model has been three minutes in a lab. Um, in real life, it's been about two minutes as far as what we've recorded. Um, you know, I, I did some timing on one in uh, South Dakota. And uh, two minutes seemed to be the longest run time. And then I, uh, during our, our freeze a couple of years ago uh, on the A model or here in Texas, uh, it was around uh, two minutes. And that was from valve switch to valve switch. So once it stopped heating and the valve switched, I started a timer and it ran through its heating or its uh, cooling cycle, technically, you know, defrost. Uh, and then the time it took to switch back was was two minutes from so from valve switch to valve switch. So in that amount of time, uh, you know, the coil would have to uh, to heat back up or excuse me, to it would have to get significantly colder in that amount of time. And it just doesn't seem to do that. You know, it defrosts very quickly. Um, the vast majority of the A models that have been installed have not had a heat kit installed. Thanks, James. Um, Mick says, what what does the acronym stand for? Ah, he was talking about SA1 and SA2. What does the acronym stand for? Uh, static application. I'm just I'm just making it up. It's, it's yeah. probably switch switch A switch a, you know, something like that. I don't know. All right. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why they named it SA1, SA2. Nancy says, uh, um, glad you could join us, Nancy. Um, how would you control backup heat when there's a hydro coil on the unit and want the boiler to send water to the coil during defrost? Would you still use D? Well, if uh, if we're on the B unit, right, and we've got a D, uh, the blower is going to shut down during that defrost cycle. Mm. So I mean, bring it on the. By the time, even even I mean honestly, even if we could, uh, by the time we actually got the hot water to the coil for it to be able to offset any kind of cooling effect that it could have. Um, it would be out of defrost in that amount of time. I agree with that. You only got roughly a two minute defrost cycle. Okay. If you want to even say, you say you had extreme weather and it ran three or four minutes, you're going to get very minimal heat off the hot water coil in that time span. By the time we get water pumping through that coil and actually be able to give us any kind of heat rise or even offset what the, what your evaporator coil is now in cooling mode in that air handler, it's, you just you're not going to get it fast enough right. and and the max time is i mean the maximum time for it to defrost is three minutes um you know it'll run after that point it'll run you know and it, it has a minimum run time before it checks whether or not it should go into defrost again but you know like when it comes to the extreme weather thing uh it's not necessarily that it's like you know negative 10 degrees you know the amount of moisture in the air at that point once you actually start to get colder is something that we've I mean, I'll say that in my experience, uh, when we thought about heat pump defrost cycles, the colder it got, the more we would run. But I'm from Alabama. <laughs> so there, was, there was a limit to, you know, how cold it was going to get. And uh, so, you know, we still had moisture in there. We still had, you know, uh, capability of, of it to frost up. But, um, you know, what we've seen with high performance heat pumps, I mean, all the high performance heat pumps really is that, uh, you know, once you get down past that, our heating performance actually uh, as far as BTUs per hour, uh, increases in that amount of time because we're not running in defrost nearly as often as we were when it was closer to freezing. So, uh, James, maybe maybe we comment a little bit more. Why does why does the flex defrost so much faster than a standard like fourteen sear heat pump? Because it hauls uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's no, one way to put it. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, we we do have a significantly higher discharge temperature out of this compressor because it does run significantly faster i'm not you know coupled to just the 60 hertz you know that the power company is providing so i mean i can generate significantly more heat um and plus you know we've got the ultra heating part of the system there that where we can take the you know 
uh, refrigerant coming back, any kind of warm liquid or whatever we have during the heat mode, you know, and, and maintain that. But it is because it's such a, a significantly higher discharge temperature. Um, I mean, it outperforms traditional heat pumps, even your inverter driven traditional heat pumps. Well, the reason why I wanted you to bring that up, though, is because, I mean, if you stand there and look at a good frosted 14 sear unit, that thing will run every bit of a 10 minute defrost. Yeah. So, Nancy, that should kind of go along with your question, you know, that, you know, you just, you're you not going to have significantly long defrost cycles. You shouldn't, anyway. If you are, well, if, if you do, we, there could be a charge <laughs> issue. Yeah, I was just going to say, same, I was right down the same path, Daniel, that we maybe we got refrigerant issue or a flow issue or something like that. Yeah. Wendy, uh, Wendy's asking, and um, she says, I'm hoping in this session you guys will address issue with blower motor stopping but the outdoor unit continue continuing to run causing their handler to turn to, into a block of ice and why this happens and the way to fix the issue well, i'm glad she brought that up because that's kind of why we wanted to talk about this today is that we've gotten a lot of calls regarding the the blower motor shutting down and a block of ice on the indoor um you know the indoor unit freezing up so the interesting thing is, is we we think of things in that pattern, right? We think of blower motor shut down, unit iced up, but we we don't normally go to. And Greg is the one that thought of this. We don't go system iced up, blower motor shut down. So that you know we we've talked a lot about airflow and and we're focusing on that today. But fortunately, we've had a, a particular call on a job site where we gathered a, a different uh, a different point of view on why that could be happening you know we we've, we've we've been talking a lot about airflow right james yeah. <laughs> and with the blower motor and it's no different from a lot of the other motors in the industry they're ecm motors and uh, so as we go along we're gonna we're gonna talk to exactly that um yeah so i i, I want to dig into that a little bit harder when i get into the slides it's going to kind of get yeah. more to so you guys can understand where i'm coming from right right put it that way um we've got a few more questions here let's run through these before we um move forward uh felix says i'm installing a five ton heat pump on a 4500 square foot home Heat will be secondary heat. If I have no Y on thermostat, how do I wire it? Um, there is a Y on the thermostat, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, you need a different thermostat. <laughs> yeah, um, not what quite we were understanding talking about, that one either. The, the, the Y is there. Like, like the Y is there for the thermostat and the outdoor unit. The only thing we were speaking to was there is no place to land it at the indoor air handler so you simply tie the wires together going between your indoor i mean between your outdoor to the indoor and then from the indoor to the thermostat just like you would any other system that doesn't have a place to land y yeah. just so wire nut it together why yeah so your wife from your thermostat wire nuts to the y from the outdoor unit right right that was a lot simpler thank you no problem man <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Uh, I want to do. I'll do the economy mode. So the oh, David, okay. David's question is that yeah. uh, we either going over economy mode. Uh, no, we didn't plan on it. No, that's not my answer. Okay, but uh, the economy <laughs> mode and the strong or powerful mode. Uh, it it basically will affect you know how the unit starts. Okay, so uh, with the two, three, four, five time. I mean, one one way to think of it as far as it ramping up and then, you know, ramping up to a given speed. Let's just pretend at current conditions on a two ton unit, uh, I want to be able to produce two tons. That's my max, right? That's, that's the highest I can go is, is produce two tons. Now, at, um, if we're talking cooling at uh, mild conditions, I can get two tons out of that unit at a lower speed. At hotter conditions, I can get two tons at a higher speed. Uh, how it goes about determining that is it, it will slowly ramp up and continue to ramp up and then take measurements and ramp up some more until it reaches what it considers to be two tons. What economy mode will do is take that amount of time and lengthen that amount of time. 
the amount of time that it takes to ramp up. So what it'll do is uh, we'll ramp up slower. You know, we'll, we'll go in smaller increments over a longer period of time until it reaches its, you know, full capacity. And then it will just ride at that full capacity. So economy mode, I mean, it's great um, for applications in which you, you, you definitely have too much capacity. Like, you know, if you were a half ton too large, for example, um, but it's also great for, you know, mild conditions. I don't necessarily need to actually hit my maximum speed in order to cool the space, probably. So economy mode may actually uh, uh, satisfy the thermostat before it, actually, before it you know, hits its uh, maximum speed at those current conditions. Uh, strong mode does the exact opposite. It, it does it faster. I haven't had anybody that, you know, I can't really think of any application where you would need the strong mode because, you know, the unit's going to do what it does anyway. Uh, but the economy mode, definitely, if you've got like a three and a half ton swap out, you know, I don't have a three and a half ton unit. So you could, you know, theoretically, you could take a four ton unit, for example, and go economy mode, and it will hit, you know, the uh, the temperature in that space before it ever actually hits to that four tons, you know. So just... David, the other thing I would keep in mind also, in economy mode, you would most likely or more than like you're going to get better humidity control because you're going to force longer run cycles. Right. So if you have an instance where like James was talking about, where maybe you're half ton too big and you've done a change out and the complaint is that the humidity is not under control as well. Two things I would do. One, I would make sure I'm at that 325 to 350 CFM per ton because that's going to make our coil run colder to get better humidity dehumidification and then second thing i would do is put an economy mode economy mode right yeah if you do the 350 per uh, cfm per ton uh the economy mode and you can keep your kid from you know leaving the door open you're gonna have <laughs> a, nice, a nice dry house <laughs> who hasn't who hasn't heard what are, what are we what are we doing trying to air condition in the neighborhood not in my house close the door already, son my son already knows where the outdoor all the heat goes so he knows that we're not cool in the neighborhood <laughs> uh so john Kohler says so b must be connected at the air handler terminal and then to the outdoor unit what if it's just wire nutted inside the air handler um then it, then the air handler won't know that it's in heat right hey, defrost wait no heat B. heat yeah it needs it needs to know that it's in heat so the yeah. defunction doesn't work unless b is connected right if b is not connected at the indoor then the d signal from outdoor will mean nothing to the indoor and and i actually tried that when i was testing it i was just i didn't have it hooked up to uh outdoor unit all i was doing was putting power on the different terminals to see what the blower did sorry i mean maybe we're reading it wrong it says so b must be connected at the air handler to the outdoor unit so you know just your reversing valve right? yes yes what if we just correct. wire nut it inside the air handler so we don't connect b to the air handler correct then d won't work the d function g won't work okay wait a minute yeah i'll have to i'll have to look at that again so, John, if you don't mind, send me an email and uh, I'll look at that again, because I think it's uh, it's W at the indoor air handler on the B, B revision. Well, there's both. There's W, w and, and D, D, but not yeah. B. Yeah, B is in Bravo. Yeah, yeah, B as in reverse and valve. So I'll have to look at that. I'll pull it up. And we'll come back to that one. Um, all right. So, uh, Nancy said, I've seen the blower shut down and the outdoor unit continue to run. We found the voltage from the transformer was low. In, in their case, it was wired as a 230 volt system and only had 208 volts. Once the wiring was fixed, the issue never came back in. That's an excellent point. And I've actually had several questions on the transformer recently. Um, so if, if you're not producing enough voltage to for that board to understand that it's getting a signal like if you put 
let's say for instance you put 19 volts ac on g terminal it's not going to bring the fan on it there's a certain point i don't know what it is maybe james knows 17. um <laughs> 17 um so so if, if you don't have enough voltage on that signal then it's not going to bring it on now the the so the transformer can... setup for 208 all you have to do is swap the blue and the black wire uh where the transformer connects to the the high voltage your voltage coming in and so for a 208 system you just swap to the blue wire i believe so with what Nancy's saying there, I like that, that she brought that up because mm -hmm. I can significantly see that being an issue with the motor. So at 208 volt input set up for 230 volts, I don't think our voltage is going to be low enough to run. Obviously it wasn't, it was able to run, but our voltages output to the inverter board essentially on the motor and the voltages back are going to be inadequate. Right. And I could see where that would give you motor shutdowns. All right. Do y'all want to move forward and then we'll come back to the questions? Sure. Okay. We'll come back to those. We won't forget about all of you. All right. So indoor dip switch configuration. Uh, this is the, the BH uh, 30, uh, three ton. You'll notice all of the cool or SA1, they're all the same. It's only the heat or SA2 that you're changing to get the different speeds one through eight. 48K, you'll notice that the four ton is a different sequence. So if you're looking at the three ton chart in the manual and you have a four ton, then you may not have the correct speed setting. There's the five ton. There's the five ton right so if there. You have a four ton. Don't use the five ton chart thinking that you'll get more CFM. <laughs> Correct. I mean. All right. We're good there. Let's move on to static. Yep. I'm good. All right. Greg. So measuring static. So, you know, I just threw these pictures out there for you guys. Uh, the one thing I will stress. We should be using static pressure probes. And if you look at a static pressure probe, the holes are in the sides of the probe. They're not in the end of the probe. We don't need to measure velocity. We're not trying to measure velocity because the, the blower charts that the manufacturer provides to us is based just off of static pressure. So we so static pressure probes, and then whatever fits your fancy, whether you want to use a dual port manometer, single port manometer digital or just using the old school inclined fluid manometer it doesn't matter to me we just got to have a tool one of these tools or even the magnetic gauge we got to have one of these tools that's going to allow us after we've set those dip switches to verify what our airflow actually is what is that system delivering what's a magnetic <laughs> Yeah, so that's like kind of old capacitor. School. Yeah, it is like a flux capacitor. But hey, they're accurate, provided you didn't drop it. But I don't think you'll ever beat the accuracy of a fluid manometer as long as we got the fluid fi filled to zero. So if you're ever wondering if your gauge is off, get you a fluid manometer and measure the same readings with that fluid incline manometer, and that'll tell you whether or not your gauge is reading right. So there seems to be, uh, and technicians I've spoken to over the years, it seems to be a misunderstanding of static pressure. So I just put this out there, just make sure everybody's on the same page. So your return is a negative pressure. You're sucking on the return. The blower sucking on the return. And your supply, obviously, that's positive pressure. We're pushing air off of the air handler into our duct system. What we're looking for there is the difference in between it. So even you know you're getting a negative number on the return and a positive number on the supply. We don't care about that. We want the difference between the two. So that's why I did this example of a negative 0.1 on the return and a positive 0.1 on the supply gives us a total static pressure of 0.2, not 2, 0.2. 
So just, I'd only put that out there just to, you know, you know, I'm, I would hope most people on this phone call uh, in this webinar already understand this, but for the ones that didn't, now you do. <laughs> It's important to uh, to note where the decimal point is. And, you know, I, I get that a lot. A lot of times just in talking about static, you know, we'll be talking about uh, a eight, you know, but it's actually point eight, zero point eight. Um, so that can be kind of confusing or point six. Or and let's keep let's keep in mind, too. So the A revision, here's the difference. The A revision air handler is rated to point four. The B revision air handler is rated to 1.0. So there's a significant difference in the blower capabilities of both of those air handlers. Both of them should work just fine as long as we size the ductwork and everything properly. And set the fan up correctly. Yep. James, you were going to say something. All right. Well, the difference between uh, 0.08 and 0.8, like, you know, this rule of thumb from years ago. A lot of duck work was sized at 0.08, wasn't sized at 0.8. Mm. You know, I'm not going to go grab a duckulator or anything, but if you take a look at the CFM delivery at 0.08 versus 0.8, it's significantly different. <laughs> so it's a huge amount. <laughs> um, so we do have blower charts. We're going to talk more about that. The Flex Air Handler does give us the performance shorts performance charts, sorry, can't speak today, um, of the CFM being delivered at that measured static. Obviously, your st supply static must be measured in supply duct, but we need to do that right off the air handler. We can't be doing that, you know, if you got a branch runs and everything, we got to get it before we get into all those branches because we need to include the entire supply duct. Same as the return, we have to include all of the branch returns, filter, whatever else is in that system, your filter grills. So whether if we're using a filter grill and we don't have a filter in the air handler, that's great. As long as we're measuring our static pressure probe is in between that air handler and that filter grill with the filter in there. Because everything is going to give you a static pressure drop, whether it's a, fil a standard uh, fiberglass filter, it's a one inch media filter. It's a five inch media filter. There's a significant static pressure drop across all of those things, including the filter grills. So make sure you're including all of that in your static pressure measure measurement. And, and something that you had pointed out, Greg, uh, when we were kind of going over this was that if you're using the filter that comes with the flex, then you technically need to take your static pressure reading at the Delta plate of the coil. Is that correct? I would because, you know, especially you if the filter, that. The, especially if the filter's dirty. I mean, obviously we want to clean that for our, our final measurements, but if we're talking a new installation or whatever. Um, some people will say that the static pressure drop across that filter is included with the air handler. Mm, I, I don't know that. No, Gree hasn't really told us that. The static pressure drop across that filter, I can tell you, if you look at that filter, it's not going to be huge, but I would still, it, it's not hard to do. You can you can uh, run your backing hose up inside that air handler and put a static pressure probe right there in the delta plate of the A coil. So now you're including everything, including that filter. Uh, one thing back, go back on that for just one second. One thing I wanted to also point out. So when you're running an air conditioning mode and you've got a wet coil. So now we've got a significant amount of water uh, on that coil. That is going to increase your static pressure. Your CFM delivery is going to be a little bit less with a wet coil versus a dry coil. So keep that in mind. It's not a huge amount of CFM wise, as long as our static's not too high. In my experience, depending on the tonnage, we're probably going to lose somewhere between 50 to 100 CFM total with a wet coil. So if you're doing all this in the wintertime, when you come back and do your spring check, you might want to recheck your static pressure with a wet coil. Now, is that, is that just, 
a second back on this. Is that something that you would normally do in like a maintenance check? Would you check static or something like that? I would definitely do a static mm. pressure test on a maintenance check because it's not that hard to do anymore. We got digital manometers, you know, you, you yeah. don't really, it's not that much work to do it. Uh, and as we go further here and we talk about system performance and stuff like that, there's even more tools out there that will actually, not only you can measure your static pressure, but you can do your wet bulb, your dry bulb. You can take all those measurements and it, it doesn't take an ungodly amount of time and you can actually see the BTU performance of that unit. So if you're really going to do your customers justice and also be able to, you know, honestly tell that customer, yes, this system is performing the way it's supposed to be performing. And, and a lot of these tools nowadays, you can even get an email printout to show the homeowner or keeping your file or whatever. This yeah. system's working yeah. properly. Record keeping. So, all right. So verifying CFM. So what, now that we know what tools we need to do, we know we need to measure static pressure. So now we're going to measure that static pressure and determine our CFM. Um, so, and we threw these out there, and James, I, I kind of wanted to add this picture in there. I thought we it'd be a good point. We we should talk about, it, in my opinion, especially with the motor shutdowns complaints yeah, we've had. I I agree. Um, so so what we were kind of discussing was the you know the horsepower of the motor and and kind of how this motor works. And so James, if you want to talk about your inverter technology here, yeah. Uh, so one of the questions was whether or not it was a variable speed or constant torque. This would be this would qualify as a constant torque. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that, was one, that was Alberto's question. Um, but um, so uh, with an ECM motor, um, that module on the back is an inverter board. That's all it is. So it's an inverter board that sits on the back. That's with an X13. That's with anybody that's got a module sitting on the back of it. Uh, that's why you've got, if you look at the module, you've got three wires that go to the motor itself. That's a three-phase motor. You know, you've got a, you've got a uh, inverter DC signal uh, go into that motor and providing three phase, a three-phase signal to the motor in order for it to turn. If this, uh, if this board gets hot, you know, the one of the ways it keeps itself cool, you see the heat sink on the back of the motor there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a little bit of, little, you know, some holes for it to be able to draw air through. Um, it keeps itself cool by getting airflow across it. So if that inverter board gets hot, it will shut down the motor. If the current is too high on that motor, it will also shut down the blower. Uh, you know, if you had a voltage, you know, spike or something like that, it would also shut down the blower. I mean, it's effectively, you know, it's an inverter board. So every, every ECM motor out there is set up in this way. Uh, some of them look a little bit differently as far as like what kind of, you know, they pack it full of black coating or whatever. Uh, same components, same all that. You know, you still got capacitors and rectifiers and diodes and, and all that stuff in there, right? Um, but that actually will lead into, you know, some of the discussion as far as this, this you know, the blower shutting down. Um, you know, if, if any motor over amps, uh, instead of burning up so that it never works again, it will cut out on the safety. That's that's the whole point. So instead of you know smoking a motor and smoking up the house or whatever, it, it shuts down. And that's why these will, um, you know, if you reset power, that's why they're able to restart. That's why they restart and go, oh yep, uh, it's working now. Bye. <laughs> you know, because I mean that's effectively you know what we're what we're talking about. Right? So James, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So often do you see a inverter board? magically quit Just working stop. and then start working again uh not very often uh, no so without it being some kind of safety being tripped you know like with an inverter board and uh mini split products for example uh unless it is smoked unless it is burn up you know lightning struck the unit or whatever uh, if you went out on the air code that's what it's for. It is, it's to prevent, you know, the compressor from burning up or a fan motor burning up or the board itself burning up or whatever. Those are safeties that are built into the, to the inverter board itself. Same thing with this module. Um, there's an LED that you'll see flashing on the, uh, on the main board. It's basically sending a signal back from it saying it's an error. What error? Um, it shut down. That's, that's the shutdown error is what we get in that case. So when you think about it that way, 
you know, why is my motor over amping? Why is my motor getting hot? Right? Exactly. So, I so mean, it's like, to, to relate it to something else, I mean, why does the rollout switch keep tripping? Why does my pressure switch keep tripping? Why does my, you know, why is my induced draft motor, you know, my pressure switch not, you know, closing? Why is, you know, like we, we if, we, if we're looking at the, you know, basically if we're going, why is the blower motor shutting down? We're looking at, you need to look at why the blower motor is shutting down, not the fact that it's shutting down. You know, uh, you know, if I shut down, what happens to my coil? It freezes, it freezes up, up it for freezes sure. Up. Right. Okay. If my coil is freezing up, I reduce airflow, right? And if I reduce airflow, what can happen to my motor? Can overheat. It can overheat. I can get overcurrent. Well, current equals heat. You know, one of those two things is going to shut it down. And, and, that, and the other thing that you, to simplify it a little bit more too is that if you freeze up that coil or you have a completely blocked filter, either way, if you freeze it up, you put a, a, a complete block to your return air. So what's going to happen? Your static pressure is going to scream. That motor in there still, by the design of the squirrel cage, not so much the motor, it still wants to get its air. If it can't get its air, it's going to it wants that air. So now we now we're stressing the motor and the amp draw on that motor because it's still trying to pull that air that it can't possibly pull. And if you got any leaks in that air handler, you ought to be able to find them. All you got to do is block off the evaporator. <laughs> so just to kind of you know come back to that question as to why the blower motor is shutting down um, and if we're kind of going through this I, I don't think it's the fault of the motor i have not had evidence produced to me yet that proves to me that it's the motor fault that's causing these things to shut down and i want to talk about this some more as we get into the performance factor of, of the systems so if the evidence is produced produced to us that shows it is the motor, then okay, it's the motor. But so far, I haven't gotten that. I would I would love for it to be the motor, honestly, and then you know then then we wouldn't have to talk about all of the airflow because <laughs> you know I've gotten used to ductless and not worrying about airflow static. All that good stuff. <laughs> right. <Duck> work. <laughs> so, all right. Moving indoors. So, what? Yeah. Go ahead. So, once we're Great. set up to measure our static pressure, now we've got the blower charts. It's going to tell us, you know, and these are given to us by GRI, have been tested. This is what CFM that will, that unit will move at those required, at those measured static pressure ratings, whatever you measured on the unit. So, in this example of 0.4. You're going to deliver 600, and at uh, speed two, you're going to be at 630, and at speed three, you're going to be at 790. And you go into the three ton, kind of the same thing, 780, 900, and so on. So, and we have these charts both for A revision and for B revision. Yep. And notice, notice the the little blanks here. That means you're, you know, if you're at 0.5, you're out of the capabilities. So if you're falling somewhere over here, then you're out of spec, basically. Right, which would mean that your CFM is going to be lower than what's on the chart. So, I mean, yes, static pressure. Is Doesn't mean the motor is just going to shut down immediately no. at that point. But, but. If, you get, if you do get higher up, it will. Um, Correct. Now, I mean, I mean, I guess what I mean, I'm sure would be asked why it doesn't like tell the outdoor unit that the static pressure is too high. Uh, I don't, I don't know of a manufacturer yet that's put some kind of interface to shut down the outdoor unit during that time from the factory. I mean, there's a there's a bunch of things like that. I mean, basically, I mean, we can't we can't put in um, all kinds of alerts to let people know when it's installed wrong, right? 
but um, but yeah, if you're at 0. 0.5, you'll have a reduction in CF film. If, but if you're at like 0. 0.9 or something like that, you can absolutely expect it to shut down. Uh, we've run into cases before on the A series model where you know where where we ended up having like 200 CFM per ton. You know why isn't it working right? Well, got 200 CFM, man. So, <laughs> so just for sake of talking here for a minute, look at the static pressure chart on this five ton. At 0.4 total static, we're moving 1,440 CFM. That's 288 CFM per ton, okay? And I just got done telling you guys, these units will run at 350 CFM per ton. Mm -hmm. So that blower speed is going to be too low already, okay? So now we go up to the 1,750. That's going to get us closer. That's 350 CFM per ton, okay? We're so at now, where we want to be. So now if we take this thing into... 0.8 and let's see from here we've lost almost 100 cfm between 0.3 and 0.4 okay so let's just assume between 0.4 and 0.5 we lose another 100 and then to the 0.6 we lose another 100 so now we're at 1550 cfm that puts us at 310 cfm per ton we're getting into the danger zone we're not moving enough air you push this thing all the way over to 0.8 I said, no, I did 5.7. So now we lost another 100 CFM per ton. So now we're 1750 minus 300 divided by five. We're at 290 CFM per ton. I can almost assure you that unit's going to freeze up. And the blower's not going to like it. So the coil becomes ice. Blower's screaming in there because it wants to get it gets it get its air, and then when you get there on a service call, blower shutdown won't restart. All right, moving over to the B revision. So that that was the A revision, the low the what we consider or commonly referred to as low static, and then the high static B revision um, will knock your socks off. <laughs> It's absolutely unnecessary amount of air. <laughs> yeah, we can get way more than we need on this <laughs> yeah, system. Definitely. But keep in mind, too, though, if you had an A revision air handler and you couldn't move enough air to keep your static under control, just throwing a B in there doesn't mean it's going to solve your problem. Yeah, we got more th thrust to the blower, but. You know, I've always kind of looked at it. You can only push so much down into a soda can. And if you're pushing into ductwork, you can only push so much air down a duct depending on what it's sized for. So sometimes the the real repair is correcting the ductwork, not changing the unit. Right. So as you can see, this motor is rated all the way up to one inch of static. So in the phone calls I've taken, the static has not been over one inch. So the question is, why is the motor shutting down? So I just want to kind of put that thought in the back of your head as we move forward into what we're discussing and we'll get there. All right, well, let's get into it. System performance. Yep, might as well. And, All right. and when, we're, when we're talking about system performance, what we're talking about is the system, not the indoor air handler, not the fan motor, not the outdoor unit, not the compressor. We're talking about the system overall as a whole. Um, you know, it, it happens to to us all the time, and I'm sure it happens to everyone else. We we lock in on one little thing, and we focus on it. And if I'm not looking at the whole picture especially uh, doing tech support over, you know, phone support with someone. I've got a really small window that I'm looking through and I can't see the rest of the picture. So I have to gather data to be able to see that bigger picture and see the entire system operation. And Greg has some really good examples of this where technical data has helped us to pinpoint, you know, what the issue could be. So Greg. 
Sure. So we'll move on. And so this is actually a job site that I visited because of the complaints of blower shutdowns. Um, we just kind of, as a team, decided, you know what, let's get in front of one. And this actually was three systems on this building. This is only one of them, but I'm kind of giving you the before and the after. Um, so, and the complaint was blower shutdowns. Blower shutting down, unit freezes up, blower won't come back on until power's recycled. Blower comes back on, they get oil thawed out and they're back up and running again. So, and the measurements of their static pressure. And as you can see in my job checkout sheet here, um, static pressure was not the issue on this job. So the total static on this thing, um, I don't believe we had it on that chart that we, Daniel, I don't think we had it on here. No. Um, but it was, it wasn't bad. It was like 0.4. Okay. So, but my Delta T was 14.7. My subcooling was 0. 0.6. My superheat was nine degrees. The superheat don't look that bad, but that subcooling, that's awful low. Now, Gree does not publish what subcooling should be. <laughs> Just like all their mini split systems, they don't give you parameters to charge on the fly. Okay? But that information can can kind of lead us somewhere. It can it can help us get to where we're going. Absolutely. So in my diagnostics of these systems, and this, like I said, this is just one of them. I look at that subcooling number and I'm like, that's awful low. So there was other issues on this job. So that's not in, reflected in this job sheet. So I need to make sure I make that perfectly clear off the bat. So as you can see down here, we're at 98 feet of, of refrigerant line. But there was other concerns in the piping that I had as far as I think we may be having some oil logging going on in that evaporator, uh, low subcooling, um, just a lot of things there. Now, I don't, it wasn't happening, I don't think, as I was standing there. But as you can see on my outdoor temperature there at 80 degrees, you know, I got a fairly decent load outside. What I'm concerned about is what's happening at night when the sun goes down. We lose that condensing temperature, that subcooling is going to drop even more. Now what's happening to the system? So the suction pressure and the head pressure and everything in the system, I'm not, I'm not performing horribly bad, but it's not performing the way it should be. And that subcooling is awful low. And now I'm thinking, okay, maybe at night that subcooling is getting even worse along with the piping. Do we got some possible oil logging in here? that we're actually getting some freeze ups to the evaporator. Okay. Now so this is again. So, so this is where your, your thought process turned to, Oh, wait, could we be freezing up before the blower shuts down? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, I went down there open mind. I'm like, look, if it's a motor issue, it's a motor issue. If it's a system issue, it's a system issue. And in my direct comment, to the contractor was there as like, I'm still not, can't promise you that it's not a motor issue. I can't promise you that because I can't see that, but I can't condemn anything else with the system until we get this corrected. Okay. Again, the, the GREE doesn't publish the subcooling, what it should be, but anybody that knows and dealt with TXVs, you have to have a solid common liquid behind that TXV for that TXV to function. And I'm barely got it at 0.6. So to answer your question, I forgot who answer, asked it, I'm sorry. Um, but kind of what I'm getting at here is, let's not be so quick to judge that it's the blower. So in this setting, I was at speed six. I was running about a 0.4 static. I'm moving 2010 CFM. Airflow is not an issue. Even at 0.4 static, even at 2000 CFM, it's moving more CFM than I really need to for the system. But is, is it an issue? And could that be what's causing it to freeze up? Absolutely not. That is not what's causing it to froze, freeze up. But these other things I'm seeing along with the piping, the low sub cooling and so on made me start getting concerned about other issues. Now, the other thing too is the overall performance 
wasn't all that great at 14.7 degree TD. And let's go ahead and move in the next slide. So this is, so I put all the numbers into this uh, psychometric BTU calculator. So you, as you can see here, my total BTUs on the system is 53,423. So let's keep that in mind and let's go ahead and go to the next chart. I mean, we can get into all the numbers, other, than other numbers if we wanted to. So this is after I changed the speed setting to speed four and let, both times I let this thing run for a good 10 minutes before we took all these readings again. Reran all the numbers. Now I'm looking at a 20.5 degree TD. I still don't like my subcooling. We're still all the way down at one degree of subcooling. The superheat's not bad at nine. And here's the other question that came up. So I asked the contractor on the job, I said, did you add additional refrigerant with this 98 feet of, of pipe? Yes, I did. How much? I don't know. So in, like I said, greed doesn't publish what the subcooling numbers should be, but they do publish exactly what you should have for your unit charge and what you need to add for the additional line set. That part I can't quantify. And then, like I said, along with that, there was piping problems as, as, as well that I think is possible that we got oil trapping. So when I left this job and all three systems were the same way, not exactly the same numbers, but close. We made recommendations to piping changes. I told them you need to pull all the charge out. You need to calculate what you should have for your piping and what you should have for the outdoor unit. And we need to do a triple evacuation and weigh the charge back in. After these changes are done, then we can redo another site visit to see where collectively where we're at. But just in those changes that I did, I jumped the total BTUs to 59,336 in your total BTUs performed right at the five ton mark. So, and then, no, I don't know the exact speed of that compressor. I do know it was set in standard mode. It was not set in strong mode. It was not set in economy mode. But so the overall performance was just in the standard mode. 10, uh, running uh, roughly 10 minutes. I got to say we're running close to 60 hertz if we're getting that kind of BTU output out of it. But so that's kind of going back to what I, we said at the start of all this is let's not get tunnel vision. You know, we're still not claiming that there is no motor issue. That's not what we're trying to tell you. What we're telling you is we have not gotten data that proves it's a blower motor issue. And, and the, one of the biggest things is, and I love that you put this together for us, Greg, um, this information, this is what we need in any situation where there's any kind of problem or, or symptom or trouble that you might be having. We need uh, technical data. That's what's gonna give us the overview. Pictures are, are great help pictures of job sites, um, you know, pictures of the unit itself, of duct work, of, you know, whatever it is, pictures are always worth a thousand words, but technical data is, is worth even more than just a picture, because then we can see what the system's actually doing, and, you know, this is really cool that you found this. But I um, think, I, I, I will say, I want to, I still, yeah, I need the technical data but pictures are worth a thousand wor words. After what I've visited and seen down here on this particular job, I wanna see pictures of the piping too. Oh, most certainly. And you know, that's something that we overlook a lot of times. Um, we overlook piping or, you know, we just, we guess what the pipe length, you know, we need to actually measure pipe length and see, you know, what's actually there. What's the foot, not, is it around 50 feet, but, is it 98 feet or, you know, it, you know, what is it exactly? Now, so. in a, another comment to the 98 feet thing, just for FYI to everybody, if you're going to push that line set to that maximum of 98 feet, then we need to, we need to include equivalent pipe length. So you got to start factoring in your elbows and all that. I mean, if you're only doing a 50 foot line set and you only have so many bends, well, yeah, you're still going to be underneath 98 feet. But if you're going to push this to 80 feet, 
or 75 feet, then you need to incorporate how many bends and everything you're going to have into it and make sure we're not going over 98 feet in equivalent pipe length. And the manual doesn't specify equivalent pipe length. I'll be honest, it doesn't say that. Maybe we should change it to where it does, but you know, the, the bottom line is these things are rated for 98 feet of pipe and that's equivalent pipe. And, and the reason that we don't wanna exceed that, and we don't know what happens if you do exceed that is because we're not actually the engineers um, they give us this data because they actually test these systems under conditions, and that's the data that we get from those conditions that it was tested at. Um, for whatever reason, they decided not to go to 100 or 120. Maybe there was an issue when they went to 120. We don't know, but we have to follow the data that's provided to us as far as, you know, what the install should be you know, the max and min and all that sort of thing. Um, well, we are quickly running out of time here um, and we've got a lot of questions to go through. Uh, did you have anything to add to that, Greg or James, before we kind of run through these next few slides and then we'll, we'll jump into the questions? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add currently. No, I think we pretty much covered it. Uh, like I said, it just kind of re, want to re, um, emphasize the fact that let's not get tunnel vision. I'm guilty of it myself. Um, I was involved in some of the phone calls with that job before we went down there. And then I quickly realized that I was in tunnel vision with it yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's, e it's easy to do. And, you know, it, if you need, if, if you've got tunnel vision, you feel like, okay, I'm frustrated with this. I, I don't know where to go with it. I'm looking at, you know, this is the problem. I'm not seeing the, the big picture. Um, Greg calls me, uh, my team calls me or calls each other to just to run it by him. I'll call James and say, hey, what do you think about this? And then all of a sudden, you know, he's got a completely different point of view than, than I was looking at. And, you know, if you don't have anybody like that at your company that you can call your service manager, your boss, or, or you know, a friend in the field, um, then reach out to us. We'll, we'll be that you know, the, the sounding board for you to, to give a different point of view so that we're not, you know, constantly frustrated. Daniel's so anyway. caught me a couple of times in the deep dive and he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> we went back to basics. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I remember an hour on the phone. It should have been a five minute phone call. <laughs> I remember one of those and I do it myself. You know, I'll, I'll get, I'll get off into the, into the rabbit hole and and get lost and and then it, somebody has to drag me back out and say okay don't complicate it let's think about this very simply um and a lot of times we'll figure out what it is so yeah. if you don't have ain't got no gas in it right <laughs> ain't got no gas in it i know why it won't work yeah <laughs> my, my daughter was doing that to me all weekend i know why it won't work ain't got no gas in it <laughs> So if you if you're in a pinch and and you've already finished your cart in a bud, um, you can use it to finish out your return. I guess I don't know. Um, don't forget, everyone, uh, we have a website, and on that website we have a lot of good information. In fact, uh, Greg has been working on some new information um, called the error code tool, and on the contractor tab on the website, click on troubleshoot error codes and you can type in the error code you have and we're, we're creating, um, they're all there at the moment. So you'll have a description of what it is, but we're creating a step-by-step -step, um, troubleshooting. For instance, here we have the FO code and over to the side we have tips and also links to videos or in this case, a PT chart and then a quick tip video. Um, so don't forget that that's there uh, as a resource to help you out. Um, yeah, and with that said, you know, one of the biggest phone calls we get in technical service is for the E6 on the mini splits. The E6 is the one of the ones we just got done updating. So I highly encourage the use of that troubleshooting error codes. 
and you and pull up the E6 because it should give you a really good baseline of where to go. Yes, sir. Um, and don't forget when you call us, you're going to receive a text back. Feel free to text us pictures of the data plate or text us back um, uh, model and serial number. Uh, please be sure that you are providing information when you reach out to us. Uh, we use that to get you to the right guy as quickly as possible. And um, also, don't forget that we have uh, a, a new um, technical person with us that is actually available for the West Coast uh, to try and to help out uh, all our West Coast friends. Um, so don't complain that you can't get a hold of us. <laughs> social media don't forget to follow us on social media we have several accounts and this particular web webinar should be posted on youtube within four to six months maybe maybe a few weeks i don't know <laughs> all right let's get to the questions thank you everybody um so uh, John says a couple of questions. The A coil on a propane furnace can only be forward of the exchanger, cannot draw through. Um, I'll take that question. I've never seen a manufacturer allow you to put an evaporator coil in the return because you, when an outlet of your coil, you're basically at 100% humidity because, you, yeah, you have, you've abstracted moisture out of the air, but the air is much more dense and as you're leaving that coil it is basically 100 percent relative humidity and putting that kind of moisture content across the heat exchanger in the summertime is going to destroy that heat exchanger hmm. all right karen says didn't you say earlier d is for the y terminal no um the y terminal is either there it's not the a revision has the y at the indoor and the b revision does not have the y to land at the indoor they changed it to d so it's actually a different function so if there is no y terminal you just wire nut the y from your stat to the y going outside yes direct, directly from the stat directly to the outdoor unit it does not need to land at the air handler uh, John says, how can I use the flex with furnace using flex as primary and propane as secondary if flex were to fail? Relays, two separate stats, out ODF state customer and snow belt. Thank you. I think, um, you I'll know, that, that question too. Yeah, you know, go mind. for it, Greg. You need a, a good quality dual fuel thermostat mm -hmm. and a good quality dual fuel thermostat whether or not you utilize an outdoor air temperature, which is the way I would do it, it would be a sensor that's part of the thermostat, not part of the equipment. You can't tag into the ambient sensor on the outdoor unit. You have to use a separate sensor that's incorporated with the thermostat. Then you, in there, you can go set your lockout or your balance point. Let's put it, let's call it balance point because that's truly what it is. Balance point would be at what point does the gas furnace, what temperature, does the gas furnace become more efficient than the heat pump? And I'm not even gonna to bother to try and answer that question for you because it <laughs> depends on the efficiency of the furnace. It depends on what fuel you're burning. It depends on what you're paying for the kilowatt hour and it depends on the performance of the heat pump. So there is a lot of, uh, if you really do your homework, you can find balance point graphs and stuff that you know allow you to to um i'm oh, sorry oh i got sidetracked right, that took me so long <laughs> so um there's a lot of good information out there to help you kind of decipher that so but but the you know that that old school i've heard it from so many guys over the years you know at 30 degrees, that heat pump needs to shut down and that gas furnace needs to take over. You know, that's just, that's another one of those rule of thumb things. And you're going back in a lot of years and heat pumps become a lot more efficient and a lot better. Remember, this flex is 100% capacity at zero. So if you're on propane, you probably really don't need to be shutting down 
that flex unit heat pump until you're at least at zero. Because I think the flex is probably going to be more efficient to run than burn a propane furnace. Mm. That's my opinion. I don't have numbers to support that. <laughs> That's all in balance point. I don't disagree with information. So. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Grant, why do these systems not achieve a higher EER rating? Is it because the heat pump ramps up and makes better heat as compared to a single speed system? Yeah, pretty much. It's also a numbers game. So, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go off on a tangent. You can stay afterward. We can go off on a, Dang it. You know, I'll go get a drink or something. And we'll talk <laughs> about it. But, uh, <laughs> but no, um, you know, the AHRI performance characteristics. So you say, um, for example, if I, if I rate my system at a higher capacity at a particular temperature, then I've got to use that number for the energy efficiency ratio. So what you'll find is if you, if you go look up uh, competitor equipment, doesn't perform nearly as well, like in heat pump mode, for example, uh, you'll find that they have an higher, higher IEER because the, the, the efficiency ratio that they're, uh, is higher at the performance that they're rating their equipment at. So they'll just lower the rating of the equipment to, in order to give a higher EER. Um, you know, next iteration of, of flexes, for example, will likely have a higher EER. Uh, it will, you know, they're going to qualify for Energy Star across the board, you know, that kind of thing. But it, it really is, um, you know, it's it's just a numbers game. But I like your explanation because it does point to the advantage of using the flex system. It's not just, you know, hey, look how good of a cooling unit I've got. You know, I can save money year round now i've got a high efficiency air conditioner but also have a high efficiency heat pump you know if i've got a super high efficiency uh heat pump but uh my heating performance sucks you know at 20 then my electric heat's on so what happens to the efficiency at that point right it goes it goes to crap is what happens so we can look at money you know money saving year round versus what i would do with let's say the most expensive unit around um Good answer. Thanks, James. Um, Michael says we're installing the flex with furnaces in Chicago. Um, is there something special about the Greek coils? Uh, I'm going to skip that part. Can we use carrier or ADO heat pump coils? ADO heat pump coils? Um, oh, it's ADP. Oh, ADP. Okay. Sure. That makes more sense. <clears throat> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, it, yes okay <laughs> well, paul says where do you find the dip switch charts uh on the website if you'll look in the installation manual if you don't see them in the installation manual look in the service manual um that is correct right yeah so uh let me pull up the b installation manual i use our website all the time Yes, the B uh, B installation manual on the on the website shows the uh, the B air handler dip switches. On the A, I believe it shows in the service the manual. Service manual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Michael says unit worked perfect for about six months and started to make a pulsating noise vibration. A little bit more to that. We installed a three-ton heat pump with Greek coil and the customers complaining of throttling noise happening periodically. System has been operational since June. I've actually had um, a case uh, where the they used the wrong size line set and um, it was making a noise. So they went, I think they used uh, seven eighths instead of the three quarter that's, you know, connections like the factory connections. And they were having a, a noise, but it could have something to do with charge related issue. Um, you know, and when I think of when I think of a situation like that, you tell me, hey, it's it worked since June. It worked great. And now it's a noise. We, we know we're, we should still be in cool mode. Right. So nothing's changed there. What's the difference? Time. So could there be a leak? Maybe. Possibly. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think I'd want to plot it out on a job sheet, just like I was showing there. Let's see what that thing's actually doing. Let's see what the the static pressure drop is across the indoor unit. What airflow are we moving? Verify our CFM. 
Mm -hmm. Once we've done that and you got the machine running for a good 10 minutes or something, then I would plot it all on that sheet. And then you could even use, and I put the, the little link on there because that was, I just Googled it, the, the, uh, psychometric Echo, calculator. Yeah, psychometric chart, yeah. Uh, but if, if you have the field piece tools, I mean, they have those now that gives you wet bulb, dry bulb, and basically just links it all on your phone. And, and right there on your phone, it tells you what it's doing. So uh, I would actually do a full system performance check on it. You know, and if, if, if it is a charge related problem or something like that, it's going to show up in those numbers. Yeah. Um, I, I'll, just if you're if you haven't been to the job site just a picture would be good too i mean just knowing also where it's emanating from you know whether it's coming from the outdoor unit the indoor unit or the line set or whatever the reason why i say a picture is because you know if it's coming from the outdoor unit and it's mounted to the master bedroom wall for example you know that might you know be something maybe vibration isolators something like that uh, uh, yeah but, you know it may not always be the equipment itself it can be you know application of the equipment or the installation of the equipment uh, you know obviously we we always look at you know the variables from it you know the variables in the installation not the variables in the equipment since they're basically built the same every time the uh, equipment itself isn't you know where it's installed is not the same every time uh, but yeah the job site visit sheets are always a good one yeah, and if if you'd like a copy of that, um, I'd be happy to send it to you. Just shoot me an email. Um, if you'd like to use our job site sheet for all of your job site visits, that's fine too. <laughs> you can you can print it out and use it for everything. Yeah, um, go ahead and add some stuff too if you want. You know. Yeah, I mean, you can add stuff to it. We can work together to make it the best possible job site visit sheet there is. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're always open to suggestions. Uh, Wes says the setup is with a wet coil for CFM static question mark. So I think what he means there is a wet coil or dry coil as far as so uh, the I don't believe I don't believe Gree published that to us, but you have an airflow performance chart that will tell you what CFM you're delivering, whether it's wet or dry. Um, so in addition to the internal filter, I'll also ask about wet coil or dry coil. I mean, like I said, you're only going to be maybe 50, 100 CFM difference. It's not going to be massive. They don't give a, they did not, they did not give us a wet static pressure rating and a dry static pressure rating. Right. Like James said, I guess we can ask for it, right? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to ask. Okay. Yeah. That was a good question. It's a great question. Yeah. yeah, very good question. Um, William says, I have said this before and will say it again now. It seems like a design flaw that the motor just shuts down and the outdoor continues to run in this case. We have checked static and it is not high, less than 0.4 and still sh still shutting down. B series air handler, not A series. Yeah, so I mean, we could say, you know, there could be something else going on there, you know, like the example that Greg used. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the charge. Uh, now, as far as uh, it not shutting down when the coil freezes up or it freezes up because the blower has shut down, I mean, the question I would have is what, what are, I mean, we can make changes to the, uh, the equipment to meet what the, you know, what our competition does. Um, is there, um, is there like a factory installed free stat on a typical system? I mean, I've been kind of out of it for a bit, you know, just, just do with this. So I don't know if, if it would be is normal that standard or uh, something. Yeah. Like, is it standard to provide? I mean, it's absolutely something that we can take a look at being added, uh, particularly in the, you know, next iteration of the equipment. We're always interested in making the equipment better. Um, We'd also need to wait. I mean, I mean, you know, just it gets into technical conversations as far as engineering goes, like, you know, how we're going to, you know, interface with the outdoor unit, how also how we're going to let people know that it's shutting down based on blower, that kind of thing. Uh, the more bells and whistles we end up adding, basically, the more it looks like, you know, 
the higher end piece of equipment, honestly. It, you know, it starts looking like our multi pro or it starts to look like a you know XP twenty five or an evolution or you know something communicating type system or whatever that needs to be able to communicate from outdoor unit to indoor unit and vice versa. Um so I mean Well, and I'll say like I said on that job that I went to visit, you know, I went with an open mind. If it was a motor issue, it's a motor issue. But when I go to a job site and collectively all that other stuff is not right. How can I determine it's a motor issue? And, and how do I is know a, it's not freezing up and then yeah, the motor shutting yeah. down? That's what I was saying earlier is I need data that shows all of this other stuff is correct and the motor shutting down. Yeah. And, 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 you know, how do we know if, if the ice came before the motor shut down or, you know, vice versa, or if there is ice or, you know, there's all sorts of different factors. You know, if you, if you've got a particular job site, we've got to have the data to go with it to kind of rule out everything. And that way we can get, you know, we can look at the entire system and then we can hone in on, okay, what could be the problem? Um, so it's especially, you know, the job site sheet that you filled out, Greg, um, very seldom do we get any of those filled out. Usually, I've never had one submitted to me. Not one usually, time. usually when I receive, when I, when I reach out and I ask for a job site sheet to be filled out or and, and I'm happy to help it, you know, help over the phone, it be filled out while you're on the job site. That's fine too. Um, but generally speaking, it, and this is just an assumption, it may be untrue, but what I usually get if that gets sent back is just random numbers of you know what it could be so if if i ask what's what's the voltage input it's 240 well if i take my meter and i put it on l1 l2 nine times out of ten it's not going to say 240 it's going to say 239.2 or 241.3 or you know so I'm not telling you that so that you'll you'll know to not put 240 on the job site sheet if you fill it out. <laughs> I'm telling you that so you'll put L1 and L2, your meter on it, and and give us that data. So um, please please help uh, you know help with that because if we've if we've got the the technical data, then we can get to the bottom of it. All right, Ray is saying, what is the ideal static pressure when designing duct? Well, in my opinion, when the unit's all said and done and running, uh, the sweet spot for residential installations has always been, and then I would consider the flex more like a residential type system. It's not, it's not a quote unquote, a commercial system, not that it can't be used in some commercial applications, but 0.3 to 0.5 is your ideal sweet spot right around in there. Uh, a reef, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, is point uh, is 0 0.4 inch the TSP or ESP um, that it's the total I, static. Yeah, total, total static, static pressure. pressure. If you're looking at the fan chart, um, you know, looking at your at your CFM chart, then the the reading up at the top of that chart would be the total static pressure. So and that's essentially, the supply and return added together. So TSP or ESP, essentially, it's more or less saying the same thing. External static pressure yeah. that the air handler is working against yeah. or total static pressure is essentially the same, means basically the same thing. Alberto says, if I need 2,000 CFM, Emmanuel J said I need 60,000 BTU, five-ton system is not going to work. I think that's probably a reference to the 400 CFM per ton. Oh, so I got you. CFM per ton. Gotcha. Um, I will say that most five ton equipment, I mean, as far as ratings are concerned, like an AHRI, it's not going to be at 2000 CFM now. Uh, just like the 60,000 BTUs on a five ton system, most aren't rated at 60,000 BTUs. Uh, you know, in addition to doing the manual J and seeing what the, you know, um, total capacity is needed, you know, you have to look at 
what the manufacturer is saying that their that the capacity of the system is actually going to produce at the conditions that you're doing the manual J at. So you know if I took if it if it says I need you know five tons, uh, going and grabbing random five tons isn't going to be a five ton system anyway. Um, most of these, including ours, is 54, 55,000 BTUs. Most five tons are somewhere in that range anyway. Um, so you wouldn't be getting 60,000. Yeah, interesting. You know, when, yeah. when, when we were looking this up, James, and we were kind of comparing the different manufacturers, I don't ever look at the, the other brands because I work with GRE and, and that's just what I focus on. Um, so looking at some of the other ratings and seeing that that you know a a gree, a gree three ton would put out like thirty nine thousand BTUs at the same temperature as a, a another brand three tons putting out thirty three thousand BTUs. Um, so it's important to to look at the spec of what you're actually looking to put in there to see if it's going to match up with what you need. Right. Um... But I guess I mean if you're if you're trying to deliver 2000 CFM, um, because the duct work requires it, or because we need to put 150 CFM in the bedroom or whatever, um, you know the limitation. Yeah, I mean that would be limited for for a lot of them, honestly, as far as the CFM and BTU capacity would be concerned. All right. But no, great question. I mean definitely run into some cases where you where you need to be able to deliver that much see a film and um, I don't, all right don't know what to do there <laughs> <laughs> grant grant says it's a real problem explaining to a customer that their duck work is terrible and the problem any tips for this conversation that's I'll a good that question. question i like that i'll take that question go so, for it, Greg. and i'm going to kind of go with it on a story on a system that, you know, I bid, I was going to bid years ago. I'm going back probably 15 years ago. But anyway, I went out. They wanted me to give them a bid. A friend of mine gave me the tip to go give this customer a bid. So I go out there and, and I look at this system. It's just a two-ton, small little house. That system in there didn't have adequate ductwork for the two ton system that was in there at that time. And it was an old R22 10 series unit. There's no way that system ever worked properly from day one. And yeah, it was 20 years old. How it lasted 20 years, I don't know. But long and story, short part of the story was, you know, I was, this was a side gig for me at that time. And I'm like, I told the guys, so look, I'm not a company. I don't have all these insurance policies and all that stuff. So I'm really just not interested in the job because you need major ductwork changes here to make the system that you have even work properly. And if I put a new system in here, I know it's not going to work and I'm going to be forever embedded to it. So when I was talking to this customer on the phone when I decided, because the other thing I did was heat load calculation. You know, I had a two-ton system. I'm like, all right, well, maybe I can get away with a ton and a half. I couldn't even get away with a ton and a half. It had to have a two-ton unit. So the customer said to me, he goes, that's kind of surprising to me. I've had eight other bids, and not one person said anything about the duct work. And I was like, Wow. I says, well, I'm not a big company and I don't have, you know, lawyers and insurance and all that kind of stuff. I says, but I can tell you this, anybody that puts a system in there with the ductwork that you have, you're going to have problems. And then they're going to come back out and tell you, you need ductwork modifications to make the system work. So long story, short story of it is that's exactly what happened. He paid one of those on contractors to put the system in. They did not change the ductwork and they come back out. And then there was this big fight of who was going to pay for the new duct work. That's exactly what happened with that job. So mm -hmm. what I'm, I guess my, my thing to you is, is, you know, explain it to them somewhat like that. Say, you know, I don't want to be responsible for the system because you don't have adequate duct work for it to function properly. So if you want me to do the job, this is what it's going to take. And if you put the job in with that bad duct work, no, you're going to be married to it. Because in or the customer's might, eyes, it's equipment problem. Their duct work's been there forever. Or, or you might not, you might not get the bid, 
but you might get the work after the fact. <laughs> right. I know it's hard to walk away from jobs, listen, do you? but you don't want to, you also can't, you can't put yourself in a situation of putting in jobs that you know are not going to work right. Thanks, Greg. Um, Nancy says, what should the subcooling be? Um, we don't really have that data, um, but what what are you able to determine just by looking at the at the subcooling it has, Greg? What what's that? You know, what do you normally look for, and what are you able to see? Just let's, for instance, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. What was that kind of gearing you so towards? The 0.6. I mean, if I put a sight glass on there, and we don't use sight glasses anymore, because essentially what subcooling is is a measurement of the of the liquid is stacked up between that TXV and that condenser, mm -hmm. and you have to have a a solid column of liquid there. Now, if you got too much subcooling, let's say the system's running 20 degrees of subcooling, that's entirely too high and on any air conditioner. What's happening there is we're actually backing liquid up in the, to, into the condenser and we're taking away uh, condenser space. Now we just made our we just made our three ton unit a, a two ton because we took a third of the of the capacity of the condenser away. Okay, so when you look at it in that respect, you know, like I said, greed doesn't give us specified numbers of what the subcooling should be. And as the temperature goes down, if you look at any, you know, a lot of manufacturers put out their design subcooling. And my question has always been back at design subcooling at what temperature? Because if you look at a, a true subcooling curve chart that some manufacturers put out there, as the ambient temperature outside is lower, your subcooling is lower. As your temperature goes up outside and your condensing temperature becomes higher and your load becomes higher, you require more subcooling. So there's no set number to tell you there, but I would expect somewhere probably around the eight degree range at minimum on a warmer day, you know, 80, 85 degrees. And if I'm at 65 degrees, then I'd probably be expecting possibly more of like a four degree subcooling. Um, again, that's, uh, it's not published yet. I wish I had those numbers. I wish they gave us those numbers, but they don't. So, but you got to still step back to this. I can't have bubbles. I can't have low subcooling because then I start flashing in my liquid line and before I even get to my TXV. Right. And that's reduction in capacity. Uh, going back to the uh, discussion, I mean, hopefully that answered the question. Um, but the discussion on uh, having a conversation with your customer about it, I, I think what they're talking about is having a conversation with the contractor who put the ductwork in. You know, they're the ones who designed the ductwork and they put the ductwork in and then we're telling them, hey, you know, you've got two inches of static or whatever, your ductwork sucks. And like, how do you, how do you, I, mean, I think they were looking for tips on, on how do you, uh, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, that could be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that. In other words, it's newly installed and a different contractor put it in. You're going out there and saying, hey, it's wrong or something like that. Right, which you would say it's wrong regardless if it's another contractor, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> we got to throw them under the bus. So you need to call yeah, me. Like if, it, if it's Tom from Tom's Heating and Air, you know, and I'm looking at Tom going, okay, his duct work is, it's a nightmare. Don't talk about me that way. Yeah, but, but how do we, how do we, uh, you know, that's a tough fight. It is. I mean, yeah, you know, of, the, the only thing you really do is, you know, pull up the blower performance charts on those and show them the static pressure. And they may not understand it all at all. But say, look, this technical data is provided by the manufacturer and they're telling us it's supposed to run in this range. And this is the range yours running. It's too high. That's the only, you know, I, I, they don't have to understand it completely to understand that it's not right. Right. But I guess, I mean, it's the same kind of conversation if you've got like a ductless mini split and it's, you know, two feet off the floor or it's upside down or whatever, you know, it's, it's always a tough conversation to have because you're just like, well, I mean, I know that it probably seems like we're constantly pointing at anything but the equipment being the problem. Uh, but the fact is, you know, when we're talking 20,000 systems, you know, have been installed and 19,900 of them are working just fine, right? 
we would take the manufacturing of the equipment as not being a variable in that formula that we were, we were trying to determine what is wrong. You know, if we can eliminate these other things first, then we can go back to the equipment and say, okay, there's, there's something wrong with this particular system. But the numbers themselves just don't, does you know, the numbers don't lend themselves to, to saying that we've got, as it stands, like a blower issue or a compressor issue or a board issue or whatever it is. Um, the variables are what we have to look at first. You know, with a the flex, there are far more variables than there are with a mini split system. At least God knows, hopefully, right? There's more variables, but like, you know, I've got ductwork, I've got length of ductwork and size of ductwork and what, you know, whether it was existing or it's brand new ductwork or whether it's, you know, dirty or I've got filter medias to add, I got humidifiers, I got electronic air cleaners, I got all kinds of different things, you know, halos and all kinds of stuff that I can add that would be additional variables on the installation of that equipment. It's no different than the site visit that I visited. I mean, I gave them nothing but excellent comments about their ductwork system. It was well built. It was well designed. The static pressure at 2000 CFM and the static pressure at 1700 and something CFM. Either way, it was not an issue. The static pressure was not the problem on that job. And I commended them for that. I said, you guys did a bang up job on this ductwork. And they really did. Uh, but as I said, as you've seen in those job checkout seats, there was other things that was an issue. Um, not being able to quantify that charge is huge because if three doesn't provide those subcooling numbers, but they do provide what the weight charge should be, and you can't tell me specifically how much refrigerant is in that unit at 98 feet, what do I go on? I have no charge amount to go with. We, we kind of have to start over. With, with data that we do know that we can record. Correct. Right. Well, the weigh-in's always been the most accurate way of, of any of that charging. I mean, it is. I sub cool in this day, is that going to change as a, you know, on a different day? Yes, absolutely it will. Conditions change, pressures change, temperatures change, temperature depth differences and all that change, you know, with conditions, because of course they do. I mean, even. I, I, I know that, I mean, if, if you've got a customer who really wants to dial it in and use all the expensive stuff they've bought in order to dial things in, get the nicest possible scale you guys sell, and then they can dial it in that way, you know? That way we know it's got the proper amount of refrigerant, the duct work doesn't, isn't terrible, and all that. And then we can go from there and have the conversation. Like Daniel said, I mean, he wishes for a bad blower. I don't, but... Um, <laughs> but but no, I mean, it's actually, I mean, honestly, the, the conversation is easier when it is a, an equipment problem. It, yeah, it but, is. You know, over 99% of the time, so far, across our product lines, it, it's not the equipment. I'm going to be honest with you. I really didn't care because if it was a motor problem, it was Daniel's problem. So <laughs> I went down that job with a completely open mind. Just show <laughs> yeah. me the data. Let, let the product manager in the factory worry about all that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, it, it does make the conversation a lot easier on the job site if you can blame the manufacturer. Yeah. Hands down. Well, I think temporarily, I think short term, it seems like it would be easier. But then you've also got to explain why you continue to sell that brand. You have to explain yeah. why you continue to sell those units. You have to explain why you're swapping it out with one that you already, you know, said was not good, you know, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, today it might work great as far as an explanation, but if you're riding around with, uh, you know, uh, the company sticker on the side of your van or whatever, well, that's, that's going to be a conversation you have to have in the future with that same customer. You yep. know, I thought you said they're garbage. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Daniel, I think we're running short on time. Let's see if we can't get as many more of these questions answered as possible. Yeah, we, we do have you quite know. a few more in here. So, um, yeah, yeah. Pierre, Pierre says, with a long line run, do we have to change to the size of refrigerant lines or the unit is designed for three, eight and three quarter for a hundred foot? Um, it depends on the bottle, but I think the longest is 98 foot, right? Correct. And uh, going over that, um could not be achieved even if you used one inch <laughs> right yeah yeah even an inch and a eight. i mean it's a question of refrigerant velocity and getting oil back to the compressor 
um, 100 or 98 feet is the uh, is the max. Is the max, yeah. And three eighths, three quarter. That's the part, yeah. part of the question there. Is it designed for three eighths, three quarter at 98 feet? And the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Scott says, do you have blank template sheets available for the technical data you used on that trouble job example? Yes, we do, Scott. Be happy to send that to you. Um, I'll make myself a note. <clears throat> Wayne says, can an existing R410A air handler unit be used on a flex condenser? Yes. Uh, Bill says, thank you, everyone. Great presentation. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, um, appreciate that. Uh, Grant says, um, <laughs> you want to read that? <laughs> sure. Why can the Chinese steal our technology, but we can't get a straight answer on subcooling for charge verification? Um, we we should fly over there and find out. Like this. <laughs> I mean, not to argue. Not to argue too much, but as far as uh, what's been stolen in this equipment, I think the Japanese would have probably have a larger complaint yeah. than than any yeah. of us in this case. Uh, Most if certainly. If I grab a, a 14 Sear Goodman, I, I want you to find what they stole. <laughs> I'm just being facetious, but. <laughs> Thomas says, "Do you have to add nine ounces of refrigerant to account for the evaporator coil?" If you install a five-ton GREE A series set up for four-ton with a 90% gas furnace as a backup and standard TXV coil, and why does the line set sound like rushing water in the wall? Um, that you don't have to. Add... I don't think it was nine. I thought it was six. I could five be wrong. James, do you know? Five and a okay. half. Okay, five and a half ounces for the coil. So that five now, and a half. Yeah, is... you have to add that. Now, so we got to quantify that too. You know, uh, you're in a little bit of a gray area there. I think it's going to be minuscule, but you know, they're talking five and a half ounces for the coil size that's in a five ton gree air handler. If you're talking about another coil, yeah, if it's uh, the gree air handler, no. I mean, if you're having to weigh in the charge back again or something, yeah, you got to have to, you, you got to weigh back in the five and a half ounces for the coil itself. But I mean, if you're using another manufacturer's coil, you still got to allow for that five and a half ounces that we would have had in a, in a in a Gree air handler. But is five and a half ounces the right amount? Is what I'm getting at because yeah. we, that depends sure. on the size of that coil. Well, versus the size of the five ton coil we use in our air handler, I think it's going to be minimal. I think you're talking. Yeah. To, you a couple ounces difference yeah well but, yeah the the internal volume of the coils uh whether you know regardless of brand are generally the same or you know within a, a pretty pretty close range the only one that would be the most different would be a micro channel and we do not recommend using a micro channel at all correct you isn't that right greg we do not recommend that <laughs> right. although i'd like to see it tested Starting percentage <laughs> or starting watts of the condenser. Ooh. What are the starting? Yeah, Thomas says when the condenser turns on, what is the starting percentage or starting watts? Super low. Super low. Very, very I, low. I don't remember it, all inverter systems don't really have a lock rotor because your compressor starts out slow and builds RPM. Same with your condenser fan motor. They don't just, you know, you don't have lock rotor which just bam and a whole bunch of amps at once. Yeah, it may it may depend a little bit on conditions, but what I've got is, uh, I mean, just from stuff I've tested, uh, one and a half amps at startup, and that's at minimum speed. So typically, minimum speed is somewhere around fifteen hertz. Hmm. Um. All right, Johnny says new line sets are required for these systems. What about filter dryers? Good question. We've actually got a bulletin out about that. Um, don't use them. Reason why that is, is you already got strainers in the system. Mm -hmm. You got multiple strainers in the system. So that takes care of the filter. The drying part would be 
drying moisture, which it shouldn't have any moisture in it. Correct. There shouldn't be moisture in there, right? No, there shouldn't be. It's bad. No, I don't want to add. Yeah, right. It's bad. Moisture is bad. <laughs> um, and I don't want to add desiccant material that can make its way through the system. Yep. Because uh, it can eliminate those strainers because it, it'll sandblast them effectively is what, what it'll do. All right. Um, Thomas says, what is low ambient limit for flex? Uh, low ambient cooling down to five degrees Fahrenheit. Low ambient heating down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but there's no pre-programmed lockout. No. To shut down at those temperatures. No. So they decided that that was good enough, you know, at minus 22 for a heat pump. Yeah, good enough. We're not going to worry about what it does at negative. Didn't want to put in the effort, you know. Yeah, yeah. Pierre says, I've heard a lot of noise issues when in heating mode in very cold areas, Quebec, Canada. Is it normal or is it because we're near the max capacity of the unit? And is there a place where we can find some graphs of efficiency versus outside temp? I am looking at that right now. I've got a graph with the uh, with the energy efficient ratio at various temperatures. So I can, I can send that to you, Pierre. Excellent. Um, I haven't really had any noise issue complaints. Have you? I've not. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're talking cold weather, though, and you're trying to keep up with the heat load, I mean, it depends on the definition of noise. That machine's going to be ramping up at full capacity, trying to heat a house in very cold climate. So naturally, it's going to be louder. Now, whether or not, it, you know, it, again, it depends on the definition of what they consider noisy. It may be normal because that compressor is at full tilt. Yeah. The, the issue, too, is that you know, it is super quiet for most of the year. Uh, even though it may be significantly quieter than whatever you replaced with it, you know. Um, but the maximum DBA that we've got published, I think it's 58. Um, I believe, I mean, that's the that's the maximum noise, but that's going to put it at basically what a regular unit would sound like most of the time. But that's going to be, you know, at its maximum capacity, absolutely running as hard as it can, you know, maybe even shifting over into defrost. That's that's where your maximum level of sound is going to come from. Um, and the reason why I said it's unfortunate is because people get accustomed to it being quiet and then suddenly it sounds more like a regular unit and they're like, well, what's wrong with my unit, you know? <laughs> so, it's just, but yeah, I mean, basically it would be like, uh, you know, I, I really like my Corvette, but it's super loud when I go fast, you know what I mean? <laughs> so <it's, yeah. laughs> but I don't have a Corvette. Just, just want to tell everybody that. <laughs> I, I work here, so I don't. <laughs> uh, Mike says package units often have the evaporator prior to the heat exchanger. I have a train PU where the sequence of airflow is evaporator blower heat exchanger. So, Mike, I will tell you that I have had that same question my entire career. Why is it the manufacturers tell you never to do it on a split system, but then they turn right around and do it on a package unit? Because they can. Because they say it's okay when they do it, but it's not okay when we do it. I wish I had the answer to that question, but yeah. you're right. And they're not the only manufacturer doing that. Just about every manufacturer has done that. And I think it's because they can only fit so many, so many, so many pieces of the pie into the one little pipe pan. So they just cram it all in there and say, ah, oh, it'll be fine. But a lot of those, too, if you look, they the heat exchangers don't last real long either. And uh, I've seen them as bad as when contractors would go out there in the summertime for an air conditioning, you know, PM or whatever. And that whole heat exchanger sweating not only externally, but internally. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, just because they do it doesn't make it right. But you can see why we're telling you on a split it's just not a good idea we don't want yeah. that coil in return yeah wendy says do you have blank copies of the job site sheet yes wendy i'll send one of those to you as well um joel says are there any third party indoor units that operate better than others any tips advice etc <clears throat> i would go with uh with a tube and fin 
uh, coil. That's, I mean, as yep. far as recommendation goes, that's uh, that's really all I can provide. Mine yeah. would be tube and fin, but aluminum. Yeah, I mean, I prefer an, an A coil rather than like a any other letter coil, <laughs> just in case those are trademarked or something. What? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but. Um, but yeah, in general, as long as it's tube and fan, you know, like a normal size coil. I will say our coils are seven millimeter, which is pretty close to five sixteenths. So if you come across a, an air handler that you like that's got like a five sixteenths or even a seven millimeter coil, it should just work just fine. It'll run run quietly, apparently until it doesn't. Uh, <coughs> well, it'll go real fast, but. Uh, all right, Michael says when using a different manufacturer's coal and dual fuel setup, what is the charge we should be we should use? Being that the Greek coil is pre-charged, we were told nine ounces. I think that kind of goes with the previous question. Um, didn't you say it was five and a half ounces, James? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wendy says, "Who is the contact for the West Coast? Eight 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 five zero seven nine two eight." Uh, Grant says, uh, put a plexiglass door on the air handler and watch to see if the coil freezes first or the blower stalls. That's an excellent idea. Um, the, the idea that I had uh, was uh, everybody's got Wi-Fi cameras now, right? So what if you were to put a camera in there and just watch it live <laughs> and see what happens? It would be cool to see it actually happen and see what's going on in there. Um, Great. Now you gave away my new tool idea. I know. We were going to get rid of it. I was going to patent sorry. that. Make I'm some sorry. money. Oh, my God. I was going to I was gonna put Malco on it and charge $10,000. Yeah. Me. I thought I was going to oh, get no. the tire in like a year. <laughs> Thanks. I'll put, my own, for me. I'll put my own brand on it and charge $5,000. <laughs> An anonymous attendee says they should support the condenser port flare better and horizontal flare outlet would make an easier install absolutely agree agreed and uh i mean that that is going to change uh a galaxy a13 5g says how well do these units handle high humidity makeup air when they're mainly looking at indoor temperature Well, um, so technically speaking, they're not really looking at indoor temperature. So like the unit itself has no idea how far it is away from set point. Does not know. It doesn't right? care. I just my Y has got 24 volts on it, right? Um, so but what will happen is that if I'm introducing outside air, untempered outside air, um, I'm going to change, I'm going to raise the temperature of my coil. I'm going to raise the temperature of the suction line coming back. I'm going to raise my pressure, right? So my unit will speed up in order to meet that, that capacity at those conditions. It would be no different than having a door open or turning on the unit for the first time. It's going to run faster um, or slower if it's cold outside air, if you're cooling still. So, I mean, it'll handle it pretty well. I mean, like what most equipment would actually it's just kind of try to dehumidify it the best it can as a result of cooling and then uh, go from there. I mean, uh, is that, okay, so was that relative to an ERV single zone liquid line drop in temp 10 feet, 12 degrees at 50 feet, 30 degrees? Sorry about that. I was tapping an answer. Um... So we'll just uh, maybe so, we'll just on the phone on that one. Um, which one? The 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 following one? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Berg there. Okay, gotcha. Please reach out to us, Wes. Um, I think John, there needs to be a little more content to those questions. Yeah. Um. John says, Mr. Contractor, you pre-installed the duct system according to who's air handler? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Referring to our, our duct work question, you know, how do you deal with it earlier? 
<clears throat> Pierre says, thanks for the answers. Um, Wes, we'll, uh, let's see, is that pertaining to the previous one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thomas says, uh, why does line set sound like running water in the wall when running? Um, I haven't experienced that. Have you? No, but you know, if um, what would likely be the culprit. Uh, so like, just like the water lines inside your wall that make noise, like when my shower mm -hmm. comes on, cause I screwed them to the studs. <laughs> turns out they make things not to do that, uh, you know, make a bunch of noise, but uh, you, you have the presence of a gas in addition to the liquid, right? So, I mean, you may find, and I've seen this with a couple other uh, pieces of equipment that we got to, if, um, if the charge were low, you could have bubbles in your liquid line. If you got bubbles in your liquid line, you're going to have vibration. You're going to have, you know, a gushing noise, a, a rushing noise, something like that. Same thing that you've heard on mini splits, for example, when they start up, you know, and you hear some gurgling and rushing kind of sound um, coming out of it. So it may be something along those lines. Otherwise, maybe some vibration isolation or something like that for the line set themselves. Uh, apparently putting the, using the copper clamps directly onto your studs is a terrible idea. I didn't know that. So. Uh, Good to know. All right. Um, Gary Lee Smith said, thanks, guys. Thank you, Gary, for joining us. Um, Pierre says, well, from my point of view, it's quieter than, let's say, a four-ton uh, York heating at negative 20. Ah, good to know. Uh, Richard would also like a blank copy of job site sheet. I'll write your name down as well, Richard, and send you that. Um, Michael says we can use carrier or ADP coils. Yes, we answered that previously. Um, Thomas says, is the warranty 10 years on the condenser, even if it is installed with a non gree air handler? Um, the answer is, if you're a GREE Select dealer, installing it and, and registering that product within the, the time period, then um, I believe that is a yes, right? I don't know if you're registering both condenser and air handler on that, so I don't know if that's enough. I don't know if you have to register both. Uh, reach out to your local rep to, to be sure on that. Um, I wouldn't want to say absolutely positively. I'd have to review the warranty information on the website to see. There's a few details that are a little different um, depending on grease like dealer, not grease like, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, Michael says ADP. Uh, Chris says, where can we find the recorded session? It should be on YouTube within the next three to four years um, or maybe weeks. <laughs> Well, we'll get it edited up and posted on the uh, YouTube Gree Comfort site. Um, Michael says, what was the answer? I'm not sure yes. what he's talking about. On the ADP coil, carrier coils or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. Uh, John says, if you use a Gree Flex outdoor unit on an existing air handler, 410A tube and fin, there's no B terminal at the air handler and the wire from outdoor D terminal goes where? It um, goes nowhere. The D. Um, yeah, so the air handler in that case would be running like it would in cooling, so it would just be blown. So, you know, I think that goes along with the questions that you had earlier on the, the B and D, which I did have that pulled up. Gotcha. Repair that in. Um, it would be like the air handler is a straight, straight cooling as far as the air handler is concerned. So right. uh, that would run like a normal system. So your yep. D wouldn't do anything and your B wouldn't do anything on the air handler anyway. Right. And then there's also a G terminal on the outdoor unit. Um, if you'll notice above it, there's no wire hook to anything. So you're welcome to put a wire on there. It just doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, if you don't use the B and D on the air handler, it'll just the blower will continue to run during defrost and right. all the, the operation. Right. Um, Michael says one of our three ton units is creating pulsating noise after three months of operation and cooling. Any idea what that could be? We haven't been able to isolate it. It sounds like uh, you know, if it's pulsating, then it's hunting. 
Well, Paul yeah, said, I'd go back to the analysis chart. Let's plot it out on that job yeah. checkout sheet and see what the machine's doing. Yeah. We could and have then, and, and then if that, then if all that checks out to be okay, then we go back to strapping of refrigerant lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Pierre, right. Pierre put a comment on here. He, but I've already used uh, soft straps for hanging the lines that were to be in a ceiling, sealed ceiling for them to not directly touch the joists. It really reduced transferring the vibrations. That's a good suggestion. It's a great suggestion. Yep. You know, I mean, if you don't have plastic straps, if you were to use uh, like foam tape around your refrigerant lines first, and then use your metal strap over that so that the strapping is not actually touching the piping, that would help mitigate the noise too. I've done a lot of that. All right, Felix says, um... I have a 510 unit, seven zone. What can I use not to overload one room with too much air? A barometric bypass. I'm guessing he's talking about a zone system. Where would it flow to the bigger room as of no, I am leaving a 10% discharge on each damper? Um, that's kind of getting into the ductwork, but. I think that's kind of beyond the scope of this training that's in this webinar. You're talking, you're getting it. You, we're getting into zoning questions and stuff like that. So. Yeah, There's, we would still have to deliver. Since this is a constant torque, we would still have to deliver. The, the amount of CFM that we would deliver would still have to be on that chart. Right. Um, now, how much that would be you know, if you did 10% across the board, the duct design, the duct design was, was sized for a certain CFM, 10% of that is the amount of CFM you would deliver at a minimum. It, that minimum would need to be on that chart, effectively, at that static pressure setting. I like, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Steven says, does GREE offer an indoor for those that want dual fuel, and what are the part numbers for the coils, if available? There is a uh, a coil available, um, and uh, your local rep can get you all the information for that. Um, I'll make a note to see about part numbers and send to you, Stephen. Um, Mike says you're saying the unit ramps up to full capacity when it in in extreme cold weather. Is the compressor multi speed? Yes, James? It, is, it is variable speed in one hertz increments. So there's uh, just a, a lot of speeds. A whole lot of speeds. Yeah. So if you had one, let's say, set up on a training cart in a, in a conditioned space, uh, you're probably going to see it just sit there running at that same capacity or basically that same capacity or that same speed the entire time it's running. You may see it go up or down a couple hertz or whatever, but since the conditions aren't changing, the compressor speed is not going to change. Um, but so yeah, if it uh, is super cold, you'll see it ramp all the way up to its um, its maximum speed. But if it's capable of hitting its maximum capacity at a lower speed, it will do that. Uh, Paul is asking for job site. See, I'll send that to you as well, Paul. Um, also on a different off topic, he says Gree's adjusting is Gree. How is GREE adjusting, modifying the new 2023 DOE requirement guidelines? Thanks again. Um, there will be a, well, technically, most everything that we sell meets the new requirements, right, James? Uh, yeah. So uh, the Flex specifically, the compressor itself is rated for R32 and R4 today right now. Uh, so pretty much everything is going to go to R32 as it stands. Uh, there's been some delay on the refrigerant change for some specific products. Um, but yeah, you'll end up with- uh, with our Yeah, but I, case. I think that's more 2025. 2023 is the SEER 2. Oh yeah, so um, uh, 90 something percent of the equipment that we sell already meets SEER 2. Uh, so they just, they basically will take existing data that they already have 
and apply that with a calculation in SEER 2 and, su and submit that data during the process of submitting that data currently uh, to AHRI in order to, to, to be able to you know, publish the SEER 2 data. Um, any piece of equipment that we currently sell uh, that uh, doesn't plan on meeting the minimum requirements for SEER 2, um, well, I think I'm not actually sure if we've got anything that doesn't meet the requirements for SEER 2, but um, anything that wouldn't, you know, we would just see a new model. Um, it can be a different testing procedure and same equipment, or it can be different equipment for that testing procedure. So there's basically two options when it comes to SEER 2. All right. Well, that kind of wraps it up. I've got a few more uh, requests for a job site sheet. I will send those out. I've got everybody's uh, name on the list that requested it and feel free to reach out to me if you'd like uh, me to send that to you. Um, and that's it. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we've still got 66 people hanging in there. So <laughs> thank you. Yep. Thank you all. That, that was a great turnout. It thank was a great turnout. Appreciate it. Thank y'all yeah, for taking the time out of your schedule. Awesome.